What if the most hateful juror in 12 Angry Men also happened to be the most cunning? Jambo, I've asked you to come up with one change for this film, and that is the question you have sent in. The floor is yours. Thank you, Freddie. Here are my thoughts. 12 Angry Men unfolds in a tense jury room where 12 jurors must unanimously decide the fate of a young man facing the death penalty. Initially, 11 jurors are convinced of his guilt for various reasons, ranging from impatience to get back to their daily lives, personal prejudices, or emotional reactions to the case details. But juror number eight stands alone, advocating to explore the possibility that the defendant might just be innocent. The film excels in presenting morally complex scenarios, like the intricacies of the justice system, in a way that avoids oversimplification and captures the nuanced realities of such debates. However, Despite my profound appreciation for this film, it does exhibit some shortcomings. Juror number three, emerging as an antagonistic force because he is the last to be persuaded, often appears driven more by emotion than logic, rendering his character somewhat one-dimensional and non-threatening. This portrayal, whilst engaging, sometimes undermines the film's rich exploration of biases. Furthermore, the film tackles the issue of blatant prejudice effectively, yet this feels somewhat obvious. It would be more in line with the film's strengths to delve into more nuanced and challenging questions beyond simply highlighting that blatant prejudice is bad. On top of this, the film's main challenge is its predictable narrative. The sequential persuasion of jurors converting one at a time makes the climax foreseeable. Once a few jurors switch their stance, the outcome for the remaining jurors becomes too easy to anticipate, diminishing suspense and the story's dynamic potential. Hence, my proposed change, a new juror number three. Let's reimagine juror number three. He's no longer just a loud, emotional antagonist, but a strategic, articulate thinker, notably still driven by hatred. Rather than relying on outbursts, he uses sharp logic and psychological insights as a tool to challenge Juror 8 and subtly influence the others. This Juror 3 doesn't just react, he plans, turning the jury room into a true battleground of wits. Imagine this, late in the film, Juror number 8, the protagonist, has successfully swayed half the jury with the argument about the commonality of the knife, but then... Juror 3 introduces a compelling counter-argument. What if, he suggests, the defendant selected this common knife specifically because it could cast doubt upon his guilt? What if this was just a clever manipulation? This twist not only reignites doubt amongst the group, but also taps into their deeper fears suggesting not innocence, but diabolical intelligence. As he senses the jury's shifting mood, Juror 3 intensifies his appeal, focusing on their sense of justice. Think of the victim, he says, brutally murdered by his own son, who now cunningly seeks to evade punishment. This isn't just about doubt. It's about confronting a manipulator exploiting our compassion. Are we ready to let such deception triumph because we fear being wrong? This tactic would cleverly play on the jurors' latent fears and their desire for justice, pushing them towards a verdict not out of duty, but as a moral necessity. Juror 3's strategy would expose a dark, common trait in human nature our shadow self, which harbors aggressive impulses. When masked by righteousness, this shadow easily emerges in every one of us. By portraying the trial as a fight against deceit, Juror 3 ignites the juror's shadows, appealing to their instincts to punish and appealing to easy virtue. This manipulation demonstrates how easily we can unleash our darkest impulses without guilt when we believe our actions are justified by a higher moral cause, turning a reasoned debate into a vengeful crusade. Transforming Juror 3 into a complex antagonist enriches 12 Angry Men by deepening its exploration of justice and bias. His manipulation highlights our susceptibility to sophisticated arguments that can activate our primal urges under the guise of righteousness. This not only brings more depth into the film's themes, but also reshapes its narrative structure. It introduces this all hope is lost moment where Juror 3 seemingly unites the jury under a banner of misguided guilt. It injects suspense and uncertainty into the storyline. It challenges the audience and juror eight to confront a formidable obstacle an emotionally charged but logically flawed argument that must be dismantled how juror eight responds to this challenge navigating through emotional appeals to uncover and uphold the truth becomes the film's climactic test offering viewers a dramatic resolution that is as thought-provoking as it is satisfying excellent loved it there are i've got some points excellent okay 
So, what I like immediately, the draw of three change. Yeah, I completely agree with you. The motion over logic, sometimes it worked. I mean, initially he comes in and he's very um, astute, or maybe not astute, but he certainly presents his case. He has his notes. Um, he talks about domestically abusing his son, all the good very stuff. Very casually. Very quickly he becomes, uh, oh, I'm going to get, oh, he's not even naming any facts. What are we doing here? Sort of guy. <laughs> Fair enough. Completely understand if they didn't have two of them, which we, we discussed in our longer form, they've got Jorah 3 who's quite like that. His prejudice is seemingly against all children. Yeah, I know. It's <laughs> and very Jorah strange. number 10, who is against basically classist and also quite probably racist, although I don't think he explicitly says anything. Having both of them felt like, mm, do we need two people this similar? Maybe a wasted opportunity. Maybe, yeah. So outside of their motives, I think, yeah, if Jorah 3, who was effectively the main antagonist in that he was the last obstacle for them making the decision is going to be that um much of a caricature does it diminish it a bit i agree so i do like the idea of having him be cunning and what i also enjoyed is that you gave a specific example because who wants to just say something like that and not at least attempt to find yeah, an yeah, example? Yeah, yeah now one thing i do think your argument was lacking slightly although you did reference it after i wrote this was how do they overcome it yeah yeah so you mentioned that the way to overcome it would your rate would have to really um, get around this massive obstacle through appealing to people's emotions and the truth, um, which he didn't, he kind of did a bit in the real film, but more spread the seed of doubt, didn't he? Yeah. So outside of that though, it does feel like you've, you've basically put in a re an obstacle that's so great that it's, it's very hard to surmount and yeah. although I agree, yes, that's the way that Jor 8 would have to do it. What I would like is for you to be able to say, okay, this is what it exactly would look like in the climax. Well, I actually didn't really put any solution at all. I kind of said like he would have to navigate it, but really, yeah. honestly, I ran out of time and was like this, I, I, at the very least, I would like this story to have the sequential thing could be solved by saying persuade six mm. and then suddenly an antagonistic force just before the climax of the movie undoes all his hard work and there's an all hope is lost moment. And then that's much more, it felt so certain he was going to win. Yeah. And okay. then that would make it feel less certain. It would make it feel like something's going to go wrong. It's a very valid complaint. It's a valid complaint about this film is that the conflict in it almost feels it feels like they get over the main conflict at the start and then it's just working out how they're going to get to the point where everyone has decided to to change. And we said in our longer discussion that one of our big issues with it is like the climactic person that they turn is juror number three and his turn is really like they basically just peer pressure him with staring and yeah. then he decides to have a come to Jesus moment on his own. Like, all right, that's pretty bad. Yeah. So... You've created a big problem to solve, a big writing problem to solve, exactly. which is a solution to what I would agree is the big, maybe the big issue in the film. Yeah. So, yeah, I like it. Now, I've given a problem and not a solution sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah which yeah, yeah. is, so I have tried whilst you were saying that to come up with a solution to your, Let's go. To your problem, which is still you know would still need a lot of thought into it so maybe we try and work That's out it. how it would happen all right so my one chain so i'll try and work out okay so you need a strategic thinker with sharp logic your current antagonist is jura three now the issue with having someone like that is you've got 90 minutes we still want to keep it short so you've got 90 minutes to basically have someone who mirrors the level of intellect that jura number eight has mm -hmm. And you got to resolve it in a way where he is resoundingly defeated whilst turning the tide. Yeah. Um, so basically you have to really change the story in order to do it. And and Big that time. would take a lot of thought. And although Reginald Rose did a great job here with a lot of the characters, that was something that he may well have thought of and just couldn't find an appealing way Possibly. of getting around of it. So what if Jorah number eight was a villain? 
Okay. So you're saying scrap the Jura 3 being smart? I'm saying, look, rather than have it as let's add another smart person to the to the table, why don't we make Jura 8 uh, still the smartest person in the room, as he is, Yeah. but instead of the motives being noble, we find a way for the motives to be immoral. You know how I joked when we did the long form? I'm going to repeat the, the joke that I made to you, which was effectively a joke. Just this yeah, is what yeah. I'm thinking. What if we actually tried to find a way of making this the thing? So... <laughs> So when we did the long form earlier, we said um, today we're introducing the film that we watch. And I wrote whilst watching it as a joke. Today, we're going to discuss a film in which a man gaslights 11 jurors into saving a a murderer from the electric chair. So what if (laughs) that was the story? That was what he was doing. And maybe it's a twist ending or maybe we are aware the facts reveal themselves as we come along that. I mean, some of the things that, that, that work in its favour, we know very little about his backstory. Yeah. We know he's an architect, quote unquote. Maybe yeah. he's an architect of <laughs> other people's oh, demise. No. <laughs> problems. <laughs> yeah. So, like, but genuinely, there's a lot of mystery behind his character. Yeah. He's yeah, yeah, as yeah. mysterious yeah. as any. He did go into that neighbourhood and found that knife. That's so true. Very easily. Yeah. He was completely anti everyone. As I said, he's got the soft sell skills completely down. Oh, he was a masterclass. And they foreshadowed it. You know, with Jura number six, I think. Yep. Six is a conversation with him in the bathroom about. Yeah, I'm not one for supposing, but supposing he did really knife his father and you convince us all otherwise. They, they, they almost lay seeds for it. Yeah, yeah. So is there a way that we have it play out as it did play out? But maybe at the end, he goes home and he's the kid's brother. <laughs> and he's married to him. And that's the thing. This could be really good, but also very easy to make incredibly stupid. Like, the, the biggest, how would we do it where this is actually an amazing... Like, twist. Tw- yeah. You uh, could. So it would add a really cool twist. And it would give the opportunity for the sound design to be more involved. Mm. Um it wouldn't solve specifically the two problems that I laid out at the start. There would still be the sequential persuasion, correct? Yes. So, and Jura but three would still be. It matters less because then the re- so it's oh, still an issue okay. in terms of sequential. Jura three is still a, a, an idiot, but basically you get the same film, mm-hmm. but we only realise in hindsight that we were actually rooting for the wrong guy. And I've just thought of a way we could do it. Off the top of my head, yeah, yeah, that leaves yeah. something to the imagination. The last, fi- the last scene of the film. Do you remember what which scene it is? When he's talking to him outside the building. Old the guy, old, old guy comes up to the architect, juror number eight, and says, "He asks, what's your name?" Architect says, "Davis." Old guy goes, "I'm McCardle. Yeah. Good to see you. Rubbish. Last scene. <laughs> it <laughs> absolutely, was absolutely rubbish. Walks off. Then guy goes, juror number eight goes, get his train or something like that, and. Or he goes to the station. It's something where he has to show his ID to someone. Uh, Different name. So his name is like Johnson or something. Yeah. So yeah. you don't even need to explicitly do the reveal. But he is the twist lying is he's about lied something. there. What's he lied Why about? Why is he lying? And what has he lied about? And have we trusted him incorrectly this whole time? Is that is that incredible? It would be fucking awesome. <laughs> <Would> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Would that have been... Would that have been a better film? Would that have been a better film? T- tell us in the comments. If which, we've... which change would make a better film out of the two that we've suggested? Or, or even, not even that. Not even like, would would which change is better out of ours? But would either, would either have solved the things that weren't as good about this film? Or do either of them actually make this film the greatest film of all time? Or, or have we just made it better, <laughs> at least? Or are we completely wrong? And are we shit? just idiots? <laughs> oh, they're really shit films. I'm sure if we're idiots, you'll probably let us know. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Like and subscribe. Awesome. Thanks, thank Dave. You. Thanks, Dave.